You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Before we start up, we're curious to hear your thoughts about our recent Camera of the Year episode, the Camera of the Year for 2016. Send us an email of what you think was or is the best camera of 2016 and tell us why you think it's the best. And send it to podcast at bhphoto.com or tweet us at bhphotovideo with the hashtag bhphotopodcast. Also, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and tag us on Instagram with the hashtag BHPhotoPodcast. Today's subject will certainly be educational to many of our listeners, and I'm sure I'm going to be learning a thing or two. We're going to be talking about post-processing solutions and digital assets management. John and I are fortunate to be joined by two recognized experts in the field, and we couldn't be more excited. Peter Crow is a photographer, writer, filmmaker, publisher, and consultant. For 30 years, he has created compelling visual images for editorial and commercial clients and is considered one of the world's foremost authorities on digital asset management and workflow. His latest book, Organizing Your Photos with Lightroom, is now available at bhphoto.com and at his website, www.thedamnbook.com. Welcome. Also, we are equally delighted to welcome a return guest to our podcast, Katrine Eisman. Katrine is the author or co-author of Photoshop Masking and Compositing, The Creative Digital Darkroom, Photoshop Restoration and Retouching, and Real World Digital Photography, amongst other publications. She is the founder and chair of the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts, which is now in its 10th year. In 2005, she was inducted into the Photoshop Hall of Fame in 2015, Sony asked her to be a Sony artisan, and most recently in 2016, Katrine was honored as an Adobe Max Master. You got potential in this field, kid. That's all I can say. Anyway, welcome to everybody here. Um, let, let's start with Katrine. Could you walk us through your typical approach to workflow? Well, the easiest workflow is to have someone else do the work for you. <laughs> I love it. So, <laughs> so that's my favorite way of... That's using. how you got to the Hall of Fame? That's right. <laughs> that's why I have students. <laughs> um, I go to the Rite Aid kiosk. <laughs> that's right. So um, my workflow depends on uh, two primary objectives. Is this image going to be for screen or is it going to be for print? Important, sure. Okay. Okay. And when I say screen, I meant, you know, monitor, Instagram, sharing. That's mostly the case these days. It's a different mindset. Uh-huh. Because if I know I'm going to print, I know I have to be a lot more careful. I have to get I, starting in camera. I need a, a better file, better exposure, better lens. Because you can get away with a lot on a little Instagram picture. Oh, yeah. In fact, sometimes I've put, put pictures on Instagram that weren't really sharp. People love him. <laughs> and I would never make a print out of that file because once it, that ink hits the paper, the truth is revealed. Oops. Yes. So on that note, if I know if it's going to be social media, like this is a nice picture, you know, something that I saw, um, I'll either photograph it with my iPhone or with any Sony camera that I'm walking around with. And the reason for the either iPhone or the Sony camera is with the Sony, I love that I can transfer the files wirelessly to the phone for processing and sharing. Mm -hmm. And I get it all the time like, oh, your Instagrams look so much better. That's right, because I'm using a professional camera. <laughs> using a, ca a real camera. <laughs> yeah. And so let's say I'm just going for screen. Make the photograph, be it with an iPhone or a Sony. Now, other cameras have a support wireless transfer also, you know, the Fujis, et cetera. And then, Let me ask you a fast question before you want to keep that in, in mind. If you're taking pictures that you know are only going to be going out in social media, they're going to be looked on just monitors, and you have a camera here that has 42 megapixels, are you going to still be shooting full-size files, or are you going to knock it down knowing that it's just never going to be that big? Go shoot raw or go home. Gotcha. Okay. Stay home. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, because, I mean, cards are so big, so fast. Hard drives are big, fast, and cheap. And so 
you know, I don't know why I wouldn't shoot raw. Now I'm not shooting the, you know, the widget that's on sale or the bananas or the, you know, the kids football game that no one's going to look at those photos again. <laughs> Apology to all football mothers. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, for me as a fine artist, quality comes first. You know, I am very particular. So I don't, I, I for agree. example. I like having as much meat on the bone as possible. Yeah. Really, it's, yeah. Exactly. So photograph either with the phone or the Sony. Now I usually carry two to three cameras with me and I know where the phone fails. You know, it usually fails in um, fine detail, high contrast, fast mo motion. It's not going to happen. So I'll choose the right camera for that moment. Mm -hmm. And then my, my go-to app is uh, Snapseed. So it's a former a Nick piece of software. Now it's owned by Google. It's free. And um, I just love that app, what you can do with it. There's things that you can do in Snapseed that you cannot do with Photoshop. Such as? Such as when you transform, there's full transform in Snapseed. I can do vertical, horizontal, and rotate at the same time. Let's say I photographed, I did this yesterday. I photographed the, world, uh, the One World Trade Center. And of course, I'm on the street. It's leaning back. Mm -hmm. And I did the vertical. I in, improved it. And it so filled to, in the corners. You, you corrected the keystone. Yeah, and it, it filled in the corners. Ah. It's not like content aware crop on a phone. I like that. I nice. showed that to Adobe so many times. Like, come on, look, it's here. It's free. I mean, seriously. And the ambient slider in Snapseed, I don't know. It's a secret sauce. So, and it gets better. Um, <laughs> and there's gonna, more. I'm not gonna <laughs> I love this application. It's non-destructive. Ah, dum, dum, dum. important. Yes, it's non-destructive, meaning I can process a file, go back a year later, open it again, Snapseed. All the edits are live, and okay. I can copy edits to other files. Meaning, I like a look because I always try to post three images a day, like a little series. Yeah, so yeah. I want them to look the same. I uh -huh. can't remember what my thumb did, but once I have it nice, I can copy those settings, open the next file, boop, insert. They look the same. So it's pretty sweet. Well, so you're, shoot you're only on going to Instagram with the, what you do for Snapseed, though. That's only for Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. Yeah, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. yeah. The Social problem media. arises though when people see those pictures and they go, "I want to buy a print." Oh. Mm. Because then now I have to try to replicate it on the desktop. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's a challenge. I try, but it's it's not as easily done because of the secret sauce they have. And I have tried. What will you Ooh. try with? I mean, what, what, what program a, when you go? I don't work for Adobe, but I do bleed red. Mm. So I'm a, it's going to be Lightroom and Photoshop. Lightroom to Photoshop. Yeah. yeah. And you can't seem to figure out a workaround or anything. Yeah, no, it's sort. really interesting that, you know, what the engineers do to that file, what their settings are, they're, it's not across the board. That's why people, for example, like using plugins. If Photoshop could do it all, you wouldn't have a, a plugin like environment. And so no, I can't. I've tried. I should not say that in public. Edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's interesting. So what's good about, you know, always having one, two, three cameras with you, I'm always looking. If I don't have a camera with me, I don't see as clearly. And I'm very focused. So every day I walk from the Port Authority to West 21st. Mm -hmm. And I've done it hundreds of times now. I literally walk down the street saying, Katrine, see a photo, see a photo, see a photo, <laughs> right? And it, it helps me be a better image maker. Gotcha. And I don't, you know, the, there's like two boring conversations. <laughs> okay, one is what a person dreamt last night. And two, the description of the picture you didn't get because you didn't have a camera. It's like, stupid. <laughs> so... Can you give us a brief explanation of, uh, and the differences between processing apps, raw processing apps, management apps, image browsers, like Photo Mechanic? Can you get into that a bit? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes. <laughs> Three minutes. And, I'm very and start. <laughs> and I'm very glad that uh, Peter's here. So it's interesting. There's, a, there's like production apps or applications and there's creativity apps. Okay. Yeah, and some, okay. of them, some of them overlap. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's start with... Uh, the shooting with a phone. What's beautiful about the smartphones is how you can expand their use with a variety of apps. I mean, there's, so, there's different camera apps for different purposes. Right. And I, I think that's fabulous that you can expand your hardware with how you control it. 
So on the you want to shoot the file as well as possible. So that would be a photo or camera app. All right. Then I actually want to I want to know where it is. And that's the asset management. And it's interesting, I have no problem managing my files off of the big cameras. You know, okay. download, rename. My phone files, that's a bit different question. It's a challenge. I have my methods, but I'm going to defer to Peter. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am deferring. And so then the creative apps are the, are the processing. I mean, a raw file is, by nature, flat, dull, and soft. Right? right. I mean, that's what a raw file is. Right. So it's up to us as the photographer to think about why did I take that photograph? What do I want to enhance? What do I want the viewer to see? And so I go into that mode more like, you know, to enhance that file to match my vision. And how much of, of your vision did you recognize as you were taking the picture and how much do you develop as you're working on it? Um, I took the picture because of my vision. Mm -hmm. I see the software interface in my viewfinder which is frightening when I look at people. They think I'm retouching them. Mm. So, <laughs> Are you doing that to me right now? Okay. <laughs> so um, I shoot for the software. I shoot knowing I'm going to get the, the best information possible. Because there's no going back. There's no like, oh, you know, you got to shoot right away. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I think is great about using your phone and having that image processing software on the phone is that you essentially remove all of the time between when you shoot a picture and when you process it. And that, to me, really changed my conception of the workflow and how, you know, how integral that post-processing vision is to my shooting. And uh, for me, the big change was when uh, Lightroom came on the phone and started really working because I'm pretty much in Lightroom for uh, my management of of all of my images and to be able to immediately go to those very familiar sliders was was a huge change in in just how I approach the entire process. Yeah, and that and that the Lightroom desktop recognizes all that and respects it. So you don't have to redo the work. So the whole idea with like this digital shooting on the phone, it's shoot, process, share, repeat. You know, that you can you're you're learning as you're doing. You're are you shooting right into Lightroom? Um, I am, mm -hmm. and uh, and we could, you know, if we want to, when we're talking about uh, asset management, one of the things I love about that Lightroom um, experience is that the images, as I shoot them, uh, and when I connect to wireless, are bouncing back into my main collection on my computer. So I actually have one central dashboard, one central place to see everything, and whether that's images shot on assignment or images shot on my phone, I can see all of that back in my main Lightroom catalog. Hmm. It's clear that you guys are both working Lightroom and Photoshop, and, and but a question that we had prepared were for some alternate uh, programs that are out there, and, and you both earlier kind of said, well, <laughs> what, what alternate programs, I guess. But, <laughs> but you did make a good point about uh, you know when you're working for yourself and when you need to collaborate, and hopefully you can kind of expand on that a little bit. Exactly. I mean, there's, there's a great number of apps and software and you know that are developed for Mac, many more for PC. And I mean, they're fabulous. There, there is... And I think that's great that people could find a, a free application that works for them, all right? The difference is if you're working for yourself and it's a, a hobby, which I respect completely, go test everything, download it, try it out. I think that's great. But as soon as you get into a collaborative environment that you're responsible part of a production team, you got to be very conscious that what you use and the files that you are working on that you can share seamlessly. And you're not going to always know where those files end up. So you should really, you know, in a way, standardize the, the, the file format, the color space, the bit depth, the layers, how to name the layers, because that file is going to go to another retoucher or in the movie industry for the posters, it's going to go to a finisher. And those files have to be standardized. I mean, in a lot of industries, you're not even allowed to use uh, plugins or extra filters because the next person's not going to have that. And as soon as then you do stuck. that, you've broken the standard. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So you see it in high-end retouching, back to the movie posters. If they use 
let's say Unsharp Mask or something, they name the file USM and then the three numbers mean the settings they used. Mm. There's no time to double click and figure this stuff out. People have to know exactly what you did. So I'm getting a little adamant here. Mm. So, I mean, there's the, the you know, experiment. Um, there's a new application called Luminar, which looks really nice, really beautiful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, once you buy it, it's yours. Mm-hmm. So no subscriptions. And the, it's interesting how they have their workspaces set up. So, and it's a very elegant interface. I'm glad that there's an uh, environment of developers, of yeah. people trying out new things. Mm-hmm. I'd uh, add a little bit to what Katrine was saying. Please. And, and that is that um, if your output is a finished TIFF for print or delivery, it doesn't matter quite so much exactly how you get there. You can use third-party plugins and, and other kinds of weird circuitous workflow to get there as, as long as you're producing a quality file in the end. Um, and experiment and use whatever you want. If you're talking about a non-destructive image editor that you're using for your entire collection, then it's much more important, in my view, that you use something that's going to be around because those changes Mm. aren't really baked into the files. And you can find yourself in a world of hurt if um, some time down the line that program disappears and Not that that's ever happened. Of yeah. This is all hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I I uh, do some consulting. I have when I get back to DC, I'm helping some high profile photographers uh, get their stuff out of Aperture. Oh, really? And yeah. it's um, you know, they have years of work yeah. locked away. And um, you know, on one level, you'd say, well, you can trust Apple to be around, and yeah, they are around, but but it didn't become as important to them. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, one of the things I like about Adobe is the, the work on, in photography is absolutely central mm-hmm. to the, um, to the yeah. company's future. And so there's no way they're going to say at some point, sorry guys, um, yeah, photography is not part of our gig anymore. Mm. And that, that was kind of your thinking on why Aperture went away. It was just It was a business model. It was part of a bigger thing and it just it wasn't... Making yeah, I think they're just making money. so much more money on mm-hmm. the phone right. apps. Uh, Follow can, the money. Yeah, can we jump back a little bit. Can you explain a bit about non-destructive editing compared to other and and sure. talk about some programs that are one or the other? Sure. Um, so non-destructive editing came about because raw files uh, were essentially read only. You could um, you can't save the changes back to the raw file because it's you know, it's encoded by the camera and it kind of has to stay that way. So originally that was a real problem because you had these files you couldn't change. And then along came a bunch of different applications that would allow you to make changes through settings and they would save the settings and show you what the picture looks like with the settings applied, but not actually change the original image. And One of the huge advantages to that is if you have 100 pictures that need the same uh, change in the brightness or the color balance, you can apply those changes to to the whole group. And it makes it extremely efficient. It also makes it very efficient because you're not saving multiple versions of the picture. The raw file is is actually much smaller than a um, comparable TIFF. And and so there's this ton of advantages. Um, You can also reprocess later. We're seeing incredible changes in the functionality of these raw file processors that let you go back to old images and and make really beautiful new interpretations. And, and so there's these huge number of advantages, but because the changes aren't baked in, that's, um, it requires that that software be around for you to... Um, to interpret the images. And so examples of that um, are really anything that works with a raw file. Um, Capture One is probably the biggest in the professional space uh, aside from Adobe. And people love it for the skin tones. They love what the engineers at phase one have done to render color. So Aperture was one, but really anything that works with raw files is going to be non-destructive. Here's a question for I don't even know if this is a valid question or not, but if you have... Files, and we're all getting to a point right now where we have image files that are getting onto 5, 10, 15, even 20 years old. Is there a point where you really should 
transmigrate or, or upgrade these files? I mean, how long is it safe to let a file sit before it gets to a point where you you might have trouble opening it or it might take on some funkiness? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it's uh, all ones and zeros. It's perfect. <laughs> so, um, you know, the good news is that the modern um, raw file structures, so, you know, sort of post Nikon D1, um, is uh, is basically um, uh, open and available for conversion, and there's plenty of open source tools that are available for developers to use to reinterpret those old files. Now that's a different story than the stuff back in the '90s. The like some of the Kodak stuff was proprietary mm-hmm. and is really hard to open, but we don't really have that problem now. So from a standpoint of being able to open it. I, we're not really in danger, but from a standpoint of being able to have your interpretation of the picture saved and available and be faithful, yeah, we that's a harder that's uh, a harder problem. Uh, and okay, um, fortunately, there I mean there are some good solutions. Uh, DNG file format, the digital negative, mm-hmm. is um, is a great solution. It offers a ton of um, under the hood functionality that most people, you know, for most people, a file format's like a black box of mystery. Um, but DNG, um, it it carries the decoding tools that it needs, color profiles that can be used to open a file. You can put a full size baked uh, final version of the image inside the DNG. It has verification tools that are in there, and and it describes. Um, in very specific ways, how to decode the file, so that if somebody comes back and looks at a DNG a hundred years from now, the information is in there that says, "This is how the sensor was made. Mm-hmm. This is the sensitivity. This is the uh, the pattern of the of the different color sensors inside the in the camera." And so, all that information is attached to it and can ride along with it. Can I ask do you? I mean, who is DNG, and uh, and and how do they work with the, with the various companies, and, and do you know how that process? I mean, yeah, so it, uh, DNG is an uh, an open, uh, openly documented file format mm-hmm. created by Adobe okay. to um, to solve a bunch of these problems. It has been submitted to international standards bodies um, for uh, adoption as an open standard and. While it's created by Adobe, it's not owned by Adobe in any way. And um, it's, a, it's a thing you can convert your raw file to and keep the rawness. I like to say the DNG is like, because it's openly documented, it's like any 10-year-old that can write file open will be able to access those files. So it's not proprietary. That's very important. But I'm going to continue on Alan's question. So I was move, I'm moving, so I'm packing, and I literally found the box of CDs. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a big, heavy box. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I need to get these off these CDs. How much can I pay a student to do it? Mm-hmm. I have one old computer that has a CD drive now. Right. Peter, what do I do? <laughs> I think you just said it. You oh. find a student and you... Uh, because that's or, the problem. Yeah. It's the, the CD, the <clears throat> file's fine, but the CD's... The Can media degrade. that we have them stored on, yeah, that's Oof. really what the big issue is. By the way, we're talking a lot of stuff about raw files and DNG, and um, sometimes some of us actually just shoot JPEGs, and yeah. some people have cameras that only shoot JPEGs. They don't have the option to doing raw. And what I often recommend people do is the, the, the JPEG that you're getting, treat that like a raw file. Open it up, do whatever you want to it, and save it as something new. Never save the changes, and keep that separate as a master file, so that while it's not, it doesn't have all the abilities of a raw file. It still has the original integrity to it, so that yes, you can go back a few years later, open it up, and play more with it with, for whatever reason. So it's kind of I, I like to think of JPEGs having that aspect to them, also. Absolutely, that's that's how you should. Work with your JPEGs. You can, in fact, turn them into DNGs if you want. True, right. But if you're using them with a non-destructive image editor, then you can always go back to the starting place, yeah. and you can always reinterpret, and mm-hmm. you haven't thrown 
information away. So absolutely. To, to answer your question, Katrine, about what do you do about the CDs, um, I help a lot of companies figure out what they do with their archives. And you pile the CDs up on the left of your computer and you just put them in one at a time. And uh, ideally, you use a piece of software like uh, Chronosync, which can copy from one place to the other, and it will alert you if it has a problem copying. And you take anything that's a you know a problem CD and you put it in a special pile, but everything the, that to burn pile uh, the the <laughs> how much do I really want yeah. these pictures pile? And hopefully okay. you have some idea what what they are. And uh, but it is absolutely time to get anything off of old media, and that includes you know old small hard drives that are sitting around. You know if you have a bunch of stuff stored from ten years ago sitting on a you know. Uh, yeah. 20 gig hard drive somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it is time to plug that sucker in and and pull those onto a new big. Um, and what's your recommendation then for that new big drive that you you'll know, put everything on? For most people, <laughs> it's simpler is better. Most people have no idea how to uh, judge the severity of like an unrecoverable unrecoverable parity error in their RAID device. They don't even know what that is. So um, I it, do. it means trouble. Yeah, it doesn't mean trouble. It actually means money. <laughs> it means hire, hire a student. <laughs> um, so if you can fit your entire photo library on one uh, hard drive, do that. So then it's simple. And would and, you recommend solid state over? Um, so solid state is awesome. It's very stable. It doesn't break when you drop it. Um, Long term stability of them sitting on a shelf is a, is a little bit less known. But um, if everything you have can fit comfortably on solid state drives you can afford, great. If you're in the you know, multi-terabyte realm, then it may not be quite mm -hmm. so affordable. Yeah, right. And you know, an eight terabyte spinning disk is gonna be uh, you know, three, 300 bucks, something like that. And you could buy a couple of them in Leave them in different and locations. Which absolutely, is, that's another want. thing too. To back up all your files and keep them next to your computer, if there's something that happens, God forbid, to your house, it's all gone. Keep the stuff away. Yeah, and <clears> and that's cloud. one of the big advantages of a you know single big hard drive as you, as your archive is you just make an exact duplicate onto right. a backup drive. Ideally, take it somewhere else. By the way, is there any advantage or reason to store CDs behind the uh, visor in your car? I notice a lot of people do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious about that. Not along the ones the, you want to keep. <laughs> yeah, the sun bakes they're, it they're in. Along yeah. with yeah. The, right along with those um, eight-track tapes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can use them as coasters also. <laughs> yes, I do. Can we jump ahead to, to Peter talk about what you're working on now with Photo Shelter? Yes, and and you, you brought up cloud-based, so yeah, I think yeah. maybe that's the next step here. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. cloud really is... is really exciting, I think, in terms of how people can work with their photos. And we are rapidly approaching a world where it's going to just simply be commonplace for you to have access to all of your stuff wherever you are on whichever machine you have. People who are used to using Dropbox can see their stuff on their phone, on their computer at work, on their computer at home. It's all, you know, it's a universal file system that's kind of running in the background on a cloud. And if you're uh, if you ever use Slack as a, um, it's an uh, application for for communication with teams. Okay. It's very common in the business world. Um, the same Slack experience is available to you wherever you go. And so that's where the world is headed. We're not quite there right now. I think Apple Photos is doing a pretty good job with this. Uh, Lightroom is working hard to do it. They're not, they need a, a few other pieces for it to to all be there. And then there's these other services, like um, I've been working with Photo Shelter, which is a professional photographer's web service that does portfolio and, and job delivery and stock sales. Um, and it's a, you know, a high-end service. And, and so it has its place to, uh, say, post a shoot, let your client have access to it. They can proof or they can take final delivery through that. And, and that's you know, absolutely integral to the way I do business as a photographer. And most of the photographers I know, that's how they deliver their, their images is through some kind of cloud service. Um, there are other, you know, Smug Mug is one that's, that's a very nice consumer-based. Um, there's some pros use it, but it's, it's primarily consumer-focused. And it's a, you know, it's a great, easy to 
get started service. Both Photo Shelter and, and Smug Mug will integrate with Lightroom. So you can do all of your post processing and you can push the images up to the cloud and make them available to people. And when yep. you say... Okay. I'm sorry, but, but I do that too just with Lightroom, yeah. uh, with, with collections. I mean, it happened the other day. You know, I live in New Jersey. I've got a great view of New York. I get this question. Do you have any pictures of the New York skyline? <laughs> sort of what I'm known for. <laughs> right. Right. Only and every other day. Every yeah. other day. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm literally on the couch. You know, I got to catch up on my binge watching. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. 50 images into the collection. You know, shared it through Lightroom client. Like, oh, that was fast, which was bad because then they get spoiled. Uh. You know, but... I mean, you can all, that's fabulous in Lightroom. And speaking of Dropbox, that's how I manage my phone pictures. Mm -hmm. I have yeah, everything too. go into Dropbox automatically. And then no matter where I am, they follow me. But when you said through Lightroom, so you're, it's, and forgive me, but it's Lightroom has their own, it's going right to a Lightroom cloud service. Yeah, so lightroom.adobe.com. Okay. And so anybody with an Adobe, um, you know, ID can log in. The client sometimes gets a little irritated that they have to log in, you know, create an account for the first time, but. But it's it's pretty robust. Yeah, and, and like it's it. that also allows you to um, whatever collections you sync out to the Adobe Cloud also sync can be synced to your phone or your, or an iPad. So one of the things I do with that is I take my portfolio images or recent events or the you know my favorite family pictures and I make a collection and I push that out and so I have it on my phone. I have a you know. The ability not just to push those images from my phone into a central collection, but to then also take images that I love and put them back on my phone and have this kind of live link. And it, it really lets you see your pictures and live with your pictures in a pretty remarkable way. And you can even, you know, do some cropping and processing right. if, if the images aren't, you know, perfect at that point. Right. So you could do that with collections can't do it with smart collections. No, ah. and yeah, it's uh, of it's course they're discussion. they're worried. Well, they're worried about churn. So you could make a smart collection yeah. and have a, you know, 100,000 image Lightroom collection. You make a smart collection and drop 100,000 images in there kind of accidentally and then then those are all going to want to be syncing up to the cloud and then you decide, "Oh no, I didn't want that." And if those all come back down, then you they're worried about bandwidth and mm. and how expensive that could be and and how much that could slow down the entire experience for you but also for everybody else who's who's sharing the is cloud that, resource and and the bandwidth and and the major issue going forward with like with cloud space and and I mean what what are the problems going forward with uh, and what are the limits the right yeah. now and are we hitting them? No, we are we are actually not hitting the limits. We're we are moving into a magical world where cloud storage is approaching free, um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But the um, advantages of cloud storage you can have this stuff everywhere, and one of the things that we're seeing is that cloud is becoming a major area of competition between services and holding your photos um, is a way that, that companies think they can make a sticky user experience that is sticky, meaning it's really hard for you to leave. Right, you're there forever. Right. Um, and so they're competing. You know, Amazon is, has got free unlimited photos for your, uh, if you're a Prime member. And um, Adobe has this cloud service. I'm confident that we will see a... Uh, larger um, allocation of space. Um, the biggest risk on all of that, though, is that something could happen, things could go away. And no matter who you are and what service you use, I am 100% convinced that if you want to keep something, you must have a copy in your possession. I was going to be asking that as a follow-up question because that, that has been a fear of mine. Because yeah, I've seen it's a legitimate services issue. come and go. And yep. let's face it, we're dealing with the grid goes down, even if it burps at some point. A lot of stuff could be just irretrievable or corrupted or something of that sort. So you you really do have to maintain your own, at least your good stuff. Yeah, I mean, and you know, given the especially for still photographers, you know, video you can get into some very expensive storage. Oh yeah, but it's really hard these days to shoot enough still photos to have it 
you know, hurt you financially to store it all. Mm-hmm. You know, at eight terabytes at 300 bucks, that's, um, it takes a long time to shoot eight yes. terabytes worth of photos. Yeah. And, and so, yes, absolutely have your own copy. And I don't consider that you have your own copy unless you have at least two copies. Because any device could fail at Excellent any time and true. With, with, no mo- with no notice. I actually yeah. just added a third layer to my And, and there should be a third, really. Yeah. Yeah, Peter taught me the idea of the one, two, three, right? So it was like one database, two different medias, three copies? Yes. Uh-oh. Close. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Three, two, one. Edit that one. Out. <laughs> Three, two, one. <laughs> I'll, I'll add my spin on that. You yeah. know what Murphy's Law is? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Yeah. Do you know what Alan White's law is? No. Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Hmm. And three, two, one is three copies, two different media, one stored off site. Yep. Right. And and the two different media. Um, so three copies. You have your primary copy. There should be a local backup that you can update frequently and easily. And then there should be a disaster recovery copy stored somewhere else. That mm-hmm. disaster recovery copy, um, w- one of those should also be a different media so that you're not only dependent on hard drive. So if you get a virus and it sleeps and infects all your other hard drives and then one day you turn it on and it crashes and then you pull up your backup drive and it crashes too because it's been infected. So having a uh, a second media. What and would that media be? The cloud or a CD? Could be cloud. Or, could CD? be a Blu-ray disc. Okay. Um, could be. It could be write once a write once hard drive. Um, but you know, cloud is increasingly becoming a really viable alternative. And I guess, given the news of late, what what's the concern with someone getting to the your images in the cloud and, and security? Um, are they running for president? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you never know who may be running for president. <laughs> uh, so, so it's a real concern, and I think that's a um, an issue that that we have to look at. So, one of the ways that that I um, try to feel more comfortable about that in the you know in the work I was doing with uh, I, that I do with Photo Shelter, um, we have a dedicated twenty four hour security team. That is their only job. And so if you need to make stuff available over the internet using a service where you have a pretty good idea that somebody's job is to stand defend guard, against to stand, it, guard, yeah. if, if some of your photos are things that should absolutely never, ever be seen by other people or there will be very serious repercussions, then y- you probably want to think, really hard about where that's going to go. Make yeah. it celebrity photos. Yeah. Yeah, I did some consulting with a, uh, with a, um, let's see, how, what, how can I say this? Somebody who was part of a royal family and there are images there that must not ever be seen by anybody. And, and the only solution is private copy, local media, probably not even connected to the internet. Mm. You know. Did you see them? No, I don't even know what they are. I was I was just I was made to uh, made to understand that this was no fooling around. Wow! Can those photos be destroyed? Uh, is it possible to destroy if it's something? on on the cloud? Mm, well, or, I mean, if they're so, I mean, I guess they want the photos for some reason. Yeah, but uh, you can delete a photo to to non existent, right? That is yeah, true. you. I mean, throwing it in the trash or the recycle bin and mm-hmm. and emptying it doesn't necessarily do right. that. Um, it leaves the, it just, it's essentially like you wipe the entry in the table of contents, but the pages are still in the book. And if you knew how to go find those pages, there they all are. So yes, you have to, uh, you have to wipe a drive and, um, the security that, that comes with modern operating systems actually does a pretty good job. Um, if you format a drive and write zeros, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, you have to be um, somebody like the Russian or Chinese government or the United States government and be willing to spend as much money as a nice house to go um, recover that. So they're not doing that to try and find your puppy um, pictures. Your puppy pictures, right? <laughs> we're going to take a short break and we come back. We're going to uh, talk more. Actually, I just got a fold with eight by tens of those royal family pictures. <laughs> we're going to get into the details. Be back in a moment. 
We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Question. We're going to be talking about uh, Photoshop usage and little tricks and tips and things of that sort. Um, should sharpening or anything else be applied to an image either before or after converting to a JPEG? And something has been... I've never really gotten a straight answer on, although I have my own answers. Should sharpening be held to the very, very end? Because you never know what size the ultimate image will be. Say you do some tweaking at full size and it's going to come down or whatever the case may be. Where should you be doing all this stuff? When and where? Well, I, I use JPEGs just for on-screen, for, for just that experience. And so the, the JPEG, in a way, is like a final file. So I don't want to do something on top of it unless I'm trying to create artifacts, which I prefer to avoid. So for me, JPEG's a final cooked output. Okay. So I don't want to, I don't, I try not to re-edit it again and again because you're just going to add artifacts. So not for me. But right. say, say you started with a JPEG. And again, a lot yep. of our listeners, that that's Sure, 100%. One. In that case, I would say it should be the very, very end of the process. Well, you, Correct or wrong? You can or, start with the JPEG, yeah. you know, shoot camera with JPEG, and then you could still use Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom to process it because it's completely non-destructive. Okay, just, correct. It, mm -hmm. it, the database keeps track of your changes, which is really nice. You can go back and re-edit it. You know, and then the last step would be, what is my final output going to be to the screen, you know, to, to Facebook, know what those standard sizes are. Mm -hmm. And then that's that. So I'm, I'm sort of going to be stubborn and stick with once you have that JPEG and it's going to the monitor, you're done with it. Yeah, I would, um, I'll give a slightly different answer. Yeah. There are, um, there's a school of thought that there's essentially three kinds of sharpening. There's uh, sharpening in the conversion, capture sharpening, creative sharpening, and output sharpening. So when you go from raw to a rendered version, so when you open it up in Lightroom or even when your camera is changing its raw file into a JPEG to, to show it to you, there's some level of sharpening that has to happen. Even if you have it off. Yes, there is some that's happening in <laughs> yes. the background anyway. Then if you're a Lightroom user, this is you, know, you can see this in, in Lightroom really plainly. So that, that, sh that first sharpening happens, that's invisible. And then what they have is is uh, creative sharpening, and that creative sharpening is there for you to um, decide how you know smooth or crunchy you want the mm -hmm. image to be. And so those tools are in there, those sliders to allow you to say you know if if you've got a picture of a you know really leafy forest with a lot of texture and you just really you know it's a texture picture, and you want that, then you can put a lot of sharpening on it. Or if it's a you know portrait of somebody and you want to give her really nice smooth skin, then you can back that off. And so that's really about your vision for the picture. Then the the other part, the output sharpening, um, is about the use that it's going to. And you can see in Lightroom there uh, on the export module or in the print module, there is additional sharpening that can happen as you're going to output. Right, and I'll add, in the creative sharpening, you also have the selective sharpening. So you're going to sharpen the areas you want the person to look at, so you know, the eyes, the product, right, right, et cetera. Right. And in all honesty, it's better, I would say, to be a little conservative with your sharpening because there's almost nothing worse than an over-sharpened picture. That's... You know, those halos. Yes, <laughs> that's real true. Yeah, and you have, to get, you have to get used to what it looks like. You know, it. I think people don't see it and, and then when you learn to see it, it's, you know. That's even more so if you're going out to print. It's always a lot crunchier looking on the print. Well, it depends on which. It also depends what surface. Media. Yeah. There's a lot of. That's yeah. a big question. I shouldn't be blanking on that. And, I and what, yeah. you know, and what the print engine is doing. True. Right. Because some of that's going to be invisible under the hood. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you have control over it. And what you have to do is if you're going out to print, you really can't judge the sharpening on screen. On the monitor, you have to make the print, and so we're getting yeah. closer to a world where you don't really have to pay the kind of attention that you used to. You know, there uh, 
people would do books on sharpening. And all books. these, you know, we were also shooting with four megapixel cameras. Back yeah. then too, well, so. <laughs> well, the you know the software didn't do the kinds of things that software should do. So you had all this crazy yeah. luminance sharpening and masking, and you know, yeah. do you do it Edges. in lab color? And do you? But yeah, so it's uh, you don't have to think about it so much anymore. And the sharpening in Lightroom is even though it's just a couple of sliders is or or it's just a, a choice, you know, screen. Min, you know, scenic, low, medium, like high, landscape. whatever. Yep. Um, that that uh, under the hood, there's some very complex calculations that are being done. It's actually doing luminance sharpening under the hood. This whole thing that you used to have to round trip through lab color and mm. and super geek out. Now you just drag Slide the slider up. to the right. I love those technicians. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you go over what a mask is in Photoshop and what are some of the uses? You guys want to toss that around a little bit? Well, a mask allows you to, you know, control where an effect takes place. Okay. So if you don't want an effect to take place, and it could be, you know, a color effect, a sharpening, a filter, if you have a mask, now we're working in layers and we're being non-destructive, that area of the mask needs to be black or dark. If you want the effect to take place, it needs to be light. I mean, you can literally think of it like a Halloween mask. You put the mask on and the eyes are cut out. That would be the white area of the mask. You can see. Mm -hmm. And the part that's covering your face, that you can't see your face, that's the black part of the mask. And so what's beautiful about the masks is it really allows you to control where changes take place, where how images come together, what is sharp, what isn't sharp. And I always feel like there's a few skills to be a very good Photoshop user, and selections and masks are one of them. The other one for me is, you know, everything know about color. But that really sets apart the uh, dedicated amateur, the professional. Now, in all honesty, I see people's Photoshop skills going downhill hmm. um, because you can do so much on your smartphone. You can do so much in raw processing now. I mean, you can get the, your image 90% there with Lightroom or Capture One. Isn't this kind of like be my question. what, what yeah. you just said about sharpening used to be like a whole major voodoo. process and yep. now it's all the voodoo part of it. Yeah. 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 So you're but, actually saying the same thing in a whole different topic. But I'm sense. keeping my 10%. Yeah. So <laughs> you get 90% there. I've given away the 10. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's sold out. <laughs> um, the thing is, is you can get 90% there. Now, of course, if you want to do high-end retouching, you're in Photoshop. If yeah. you want to do compositing, you're in Photoshop. If you're going to go to video, sort et cetera. Of. What? Compositing? Yeah. You can do panorama and HDR. Yes. Uh, non yeah, but I'm talking about. Room, but yeah. I'm talking about putting a camel on the moon. <laughs> yeah, right. Like those real things. That's a, that's that a photo. Believe. That's a Photoshop. So, so when thing. do you yeah. in in your day to day? When do you jump to Photoshop? So, I use Lightroom primarily for the the global changes. Make that file look really really good. I use Lightroom to make many files look very very good, and Photoshop to perfect a few. Okay. Because we oh. all shoot more. Okay. Yeah. Right, we're not hold, but holding to thirty six exposures anymore, and it's like I'm not going to open two hundred images of a shoot in Photoshop. Right. So you know, Lightroom will get you ninety percent there, and then if you if you're going to make a large print and you're going to see everything, you've got to go into Photoshop to do that final refinement. That was actually a question I wanted to jump hmm. back to because you, you had said it depends if you're going you know to your phone or to print, and we never got to your your workflow for print. Oh. And is that is that kind of what it is? Yep. Then you put it to Photoshop and make. So your when final I know touches. I'm going to going to go to print, I need to look at every pixel and check it out. It's amazing. You make a print and suddenly you're like, what? I yeah. never knew that dust spot was there. Oh yeah. You don't see it. Oh yeah. And so, and also. Looking on screen, it's very seductive. I think it has to do with like when we lived in caves and stared at <laughs> fires, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now, when you make a print, there's this object that you can study, live with, reflect on, circle with a sharpie, you know, and it it becomes its own entity. Because on screen, everything is so flexible, so fluid. You sort of, it's very seductive. So once that print, then you're like, oh, now I'm going to make another print. What can I do to make it better? Because it's, you know, media, ink, et cetera. So the print is really that that ultimate step. And that, for me, I need Photoshop for that. Now, you know, I hear people like, oh, why doesn't Lightroom have layers? Why doesn't Lightroom have masks? 
there's an application that does. <laughs> or as a, I will use a Jeff Shuey's line, Photoshop is a great Lightroom plugin. <laughs> yeah, I tend to use it for uh, for professional assignments um, for that one master file that's going to end up, you know, the small number of master files that are going to end up uh, being used in print reproduction. Um, occasionally for stuff I print, but I print a lot straight out of Lightroom without mm. without doing without round tripping through Photoshop. Here's a question for it. Considering the two gigabyte limit on PSD files, the four gigabyte limit on TIFFs, uh, and the long saving times associated with compressed files, what are the best practices when working with larger size multi-layer projects or panoramas? So the Adobe's addressed that limitation with the PSB file format, and Photoshop Big. Oh, okay. Which is now you know up to sixty-five thousand pixels in width or height. Yeah, and it's then, uh, and, and it's the gigantic. Gi the gigabyteage is like because that two gigabyte limit that used to be a photo, it still is a Photoshop document. Man, compositing and retouchers hit that easily, especially now with these. You know, you have a DSLR, a mirrorless camera with forty-two megapixels. So PSB um, works for that. Of course, there's one application that will open that file. You know, it's Photoshop. Adobe's also done a great job in saving in the background. Or saving now, you can close your, you know, it'll close it when you when you're done, and they really uh, stepped up, especially with panoramics, because people were easily hitting that limit. So PSBs, um, and don't use them for regular Photoshop files because they, they they are bigger, they don't have as much compression, and they take longer to save. But for production and these big files that we work on, you should investigate PSB. Yeah, and there's a uh, one of the reasons that that two gig limit exists is there's a lot of subsystems out there that your images or that your files actually pass through. They that can't handle all that capacity? Historically, okay. they just haven't been able to deal with files that big. This is an interesting thing, and I've never been quite clear in this myself. The difference is between curves and level adjustments in Photoshop. What exactly is the difference? I use both of them, and they seem to do the same thing. But what is the difference? It's the difference is how you actually interact with the file. So levels gives you three places that you can uh, manipulate the data, the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights. Okay. And you can see the histogram, and that's what it does. Curves gives you up to 16 points on a curve. If you want pre precise control, you're heading into curves. Is also less destructive to the image quality? Yeah, as long as you're curves? using adjustment layers, and I will start shouting. Oh, um, because, you know, that's something that, if you want to work non-destructively and take care of your file, you've got to use adjustment layers. Okay. And a lot of people still don't, and it it really gets me upset. I should like start a movement <laughs> <laughs> or a, a change.org campaign. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. that's the answer to the question that we had. Is, you oh, know, what, what's the one the one thing about? Oh, I've got that, two of that. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So Good. I mean, it's and it's you know. A, I am so glad I started working with Photoshop. I mean, literally before it was released, uh -huh. so like version 0.89, you know, so. It was coal I, operated back then. Pretty right? much. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Bellow. Because if, if I look at Photoshop now and go, oh my gosh, I need to learn this, it would freak me out. I mean, it's a 10 ton gorilla because it, it's such a big application because so many different kinds of people use it. Jason and I were talking about that just yesterday, but you, you mentioning how complex it is. And, and my reaction was, I don't think anybody knows the complete Photoshop. I don't, I don't know if you There's can. There's probably like three people in San Jose. And they do not have a social life. <laughs> the good thing about that is what, what you have to do when you're using Photoshop is you really have to filter in. This is what I need to do and not let yourself get distracted. So for people that are, the two things that really upset me when, people working on their images is they don't use adjustment layers because adjustment layers are like very small in file size. They support opacity. They support blending modes. They support masking. You can drag and drop them across files. So I love adjustment layers. So I'm very adamant to use it. And then the next thing is the command key for the eraser is E and that stands for evil. <laughs> yeah, because you're deleting pixels. Right. I mean, those two tools. Mask them instead. Uh, if I mean, I try to get them like, come on, take the eraser out. Of course, I'm not winning that war. But of course, it's really just a brush. But because once those pixels are gone and you save that file. So something that um, may not be immediately obvious, but once you, once you think about it, it makes a ton of sense. All Photoshop is really doing 
is pushing numbers around, right? It's uh, digital photo is an image converted to numbers. And so each pixel has a value of, you know, red, green, and blue if it's an RGB file. And all of those tools are math geek tools, curves and histograms, uh, and, you know, levels as, as a thing that works on a histogram. Um, the first however many versions uh, until we got into camera raw and Lightroom were all really um, – they came from the DNA of Thomas Knoll who, who invented Photoshop who's a math whiz. And that was the thing that he did. And that's why all the metaphors and all the visual interface is all math. In the more modern applications, it's not math. It's exposure. And it's measured in f-stops stuff that photographers understand or color temperature. Um, and so as we, you know, as the, the evolution into camera raw and into Lightroom and, and now, you know, a million other apps, they are presenting this information to you as a photographer. Just, and, they just changed the language or the dialect in a sense. Yeah. It's, it's, it's well, how you present the information. It's that and it's, it's the metaphor and, and how yeah, they work. Metaphors. It's, it's not just the, it isn't just the label of the tool, but it is also how do you split up that math in a way that makes sense to a photographer? And what that lets what that does is it lets the software interface recede so you can concentrate more on the image. And that's so important. Yeah. Instead of trying to figure out what, you know, Gaussian blur actually does. It's like, oh, it's named after a German physicist. Does not help me use the <laughs> yeah, high, ra high radius sharpening, which was that wonderful yeah, trick that, that essentially be is clarity. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's you know, look in a 50 pixel circle around here and, and it boost the contrast just in that little local area, which, I mean, super geeky and, and you know, not a thing anybody would ever figure out on their own. Yep. Now it's a slider. Yeah. So I think, I mean, we're in a great time with digital photography and digital imaging. And there's lots of choices, be it your smartphone or a high-end camera, be it a free app or a professional application. And, you know, I love when people say, oh, everybody's a photographer. I'm like, great. Yes, it's great. awesome. Exactly. <laughs> it that means awesome. more people are becoming yeah. visually astute or smart or interacting with the world. You have to, well, most of the time, like, go out to take pictures. So you're not, like, isolated. So I think, I think all of these options are great. You know, and... If you want to learn, there's so many resources now. I mean, obviously, you know, there's there's forums, there's conferences, there's magazines. BH Photography Podcast. At 100%. Yeah. You know, we're moving I, sliders I here. I listen to it every week. Time. <laughs> One last question. What what could you recommend as being essential extensions or plugins for Photoshop? Anyone who's working now in the tool. Yep. I Well, I love the, uh, the NIC plugins, which mm -hmm. are now Google. Right. And um, there's a number of reasons to love them. I love them when I had to pay for them. <laughs> but, but Silver Effects Pro, yeah. I mean, if you like black and white photography, that is fabulous. So I'm, I'm, I still have it installed. I can access it either from Lightroom or from Photoshop. It's killer. And it's like people are like, oh, I can do that in Photoshop. No, you really can't because they put so much engineering into it. So the NIC features are great. Um, you know, perfectly clear, perfect exposure. Topaz Labs has great plugins. You know, so you want to take a look at them. What's great nowadays about software is they always have those free trials. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like crack dealer. It's great. Um, <laughs> but so you can try it on your own pictures for like. Actually, my crack dealer's name was Nick Silver, so it all works out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so you can try it and see if it's going to fit your look. You know, you know, do you want the overcooked HDR or not? You know, so I mean. It's a, it's, we can really enjoy that now. So I, I think there's some really good plugins out there. I hardly ever use any plugins. Uh, occasionally I'll, I'll uh, pull up Photomatics for HDR, <clears throat> but, um, I, I like what I get out of the raw conversion. The stuff I do in Photoshop typically is, you know, cleanup or compositing for, uh, for a, you know, master file that's going out to, to uh, you know, a client delivery. For my own work, I'm much more about what I can do with the camera and my understanding of how the processing, you know, the, the raw file conversion is connected to it. You know, it's it's. I feel like it's a it's a natural extension of what I used to do in the darkroom with black and white photography. You know, I used to always shoot full frame, 
and, you know, love to print with a black border. And it was, what can I do? You know, I would, I would pre-visualize that as I'm shooting. And then I know when I go into the dark room, I'd make that. And that, and it's, you know, it's a whole different tool set, but that's really what I'm, what I'm looking at and, and obviously working in color, but that's, that's the way I approach photography. And, uh, so I don't do a lot of this, um, plug-in jazz. Well, <laughs> it's not that you a lot of plugins, but I've never met a pixel. I didn't want to change. <laughs> well, there's one more that I, I, I did want to ask about noise reduction and uh, Ooh, yeah. and, and the, the proper yeah, approach, yeah. And, and that will be the last of the yeah. The that's a touchy questions. one. Any noise? Well, 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 you want to understand where noise comes from. I mean, it's it's usually you know you've increased your ISO or you've underexposed the file. Which, mm -hmm. I mean, I know they're related. So if you can avoid it, great. The newer cameras now, I mean, there's there's luminance noise, which is more structural. Then there's color noise, which is truly ugly. And that you see that a lot in your older camera files. Um, these newer cameras, I mean, sometimes I think I don't have to take off the lens cap. I mean, they're shooting like 104,000. Oh, it's sick. Yeah. It's absolutely right? yeah. It's sick. But, yeah. Which is also great because it expands the time that you can take pictures. Okay. Yeah, noise is, um, you need to think of it in conjunction with sharpening. Yeah. Because sharpening is what makes the noise show, typically. That's what makes it yes. worse. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, noise is one of those um, one of those problems where computers can fix it um, pretty easily because it's you know it's it's a it's a kind of problem that lends itself to an automated solution as part of a sharpening algorithm. And um, I found that the noise reduction in Lightroom is really really good, and it's. It ends up being a, a little bit of a iterative process where you know I get it as sharp as I want, then I do some masking, which um, which reduces noise and sharpness in smooth areas of the picture, and then I'll it, particularly for small sensor cameras, um, I end up needing to do some noise reduction uh, underexposed pictures off of my phone or off of uh, you know one of the small pocket cameras that I use. Um, I almost always have to do some noise reduction, but then and then I'll go back and have to tweak sharpening or detail at the same time. But it it's amazing what you know dragging that slider to the right can do. Yep. Reducing noise often softens an image because noise is unwanted signal. Mm -hmm. So you're softening it by let's say denoising it, and then the sharpening is trying to bring those details back. So it's always a, a give and take. Another thing I do is if I I'll push the black slider down to make those shadows go a little richer, a little darker. And it's like, boop, bye-bye, because people don't look in the shadows anyway. So, and back to the cameras nowadays, I actually like when you, when I shoot at like 3200, like on the Sonys or 1600, it's not, it doesn't have that color artifact. It's got this really fine little like black speckling, which I'm not going to equate it to film, but I know what you it, mean. it yeah. gives it a nice look because lots of times Back to compositing or retouching, one of the last steps you do is you'd add a soft light layer and add a film grain or a noise to that because it covers up any of your tracks. And also, lots of times digital camera files have a tendency of looking rather um, computer generated, you know, especially on flat surfaces, skies. So we'll add some luminance noise back in and it gives your eye something to hang on to. So that might still be a throwback to how we saw prints with film. Yeah, but that's great. That's a great we used to, tip. Yeah, we used but to fall not, back to that pebble surface paper to cover up the right. errors. Hmm. So it's not right. like right. <laughs> all noise is not bad. Right. 10, 15 years ago, I would never say that because color noise, ugh, me, that's ugly. Here's a question for you. I, I don't even know if it's really answerable because there's so many different types of cameras in every manufacturer and brand. It, it's a little bit different. But how many stops can you push now from the native ISO of the average Decent camera, meaning prosumer camera. How many stops can you push before you say, okay, now we're going to get into a point where the noise is going to be a little bit annoying? There's a really educational or illuminating test that, um, that I do when I teach classes. Please, and ahead. that is that I have people um, run a set of brackets, a stop okay. apart, and then put the images in their post-processing software. What are they photographing? Is it a blank screen or a gray um, card or what? Uh, two, two kinds of scenes, a, a low contrast scene and a high contrast scene. Okay. So, but the key is to put the card back in the camera and then look at your flashing highlights 
and see how often those flashing highlights are actually recoverable on a raw file. Because the thing that's flashing is not a place where there's no raw file detail. It's a place where the JPEG that your camera made, to show you on the back of the camera, where there's no detail in the JPEG in one of the color channels. And so one of the things you'll find is that there are, in most cameras, there's uh, flashing highlights that are actually have a ton of detail in there. And you know these are all uh, decisions that the camera engineers are making to say, okay, where are we going to start telling the photographer he's overexposed or she's overexposed the picture? And we have to make a decision about the conversion to JPEG that happens in the camera and then, and then where we're, where we're going to give you warning. And I found that even, you know, I'm typically a Nikon shooter. Um, I found that even in the Nikon line, different cameras have more or less headroom and, you know, cause they're tweaking at each new camera model that comes out. And so you really, if you want to know when you're shooting, am I really overexposing it? Then you need to, you need to connect the two. What's my final product look like? What am I being told in camera? And I think also, you know, testing for, for um, noise and high ISO, I'm shooting assignments at, at uh, 6,400 ISO with regularity um, with D800 uh, or D750 and uh, getting beautiful files with just a, just a, a little smidgen of, of noise reduction. I give a similar assignment to my, to my students. Okay. You know, to do this bracket, and then we uh, have them bring it into Photoshop and to match the over and under to the normal, so they actually see how yeah. much the the processing okay. can do. Yes, but also to understand that once you increase that ISO, it's not just noise; you're you're going to re you're reducing contrast. Yes, yes, and yes, detail. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, know, your highlights you, and details you need start to, under, to go. You know, have, yeah, people well. really need to understand that. It's like. You can't really trust what the manufacturer is saying. You need to test your yeah. own equipment in yeah. your own like working. And by the way, the takeaway really is run a test on your gear and just see what the tolerances are and how far you can yeah. push your camera. You, you should, should also test all your lenses. <laughs> oh yes, and that is one of the things that um, it can be shocking. Okay, well, I tell you, I've, I I know I've learned a, a more than more than a thing or two today. This has been terrific. Really appreciate it. Can you guys tell us a little bit about what you're up to right now? Upcoming projects, uh, Katrine? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm concentrating on the, the Master's in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts, mm -hmm. you know, because I could probably update the courses like each week, <laughs> which I really don't want to do. But, um, you know, I, I put a lot of time into that program. We offer it both in classroom and online. And as a slight spinoff from that, um, SVA is now working on type of uh, certificate programs. And we're working with a, a, a developer called Cadenze. Dot com and they've asked me to develop really practical courses for photographers. So we're working right now on photographers to videographer, photographer to 3D, because photographers have, and there's one photographer to asset manager I was going to talk to Peter about. Um, he doesn't Good. know that yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, we, we have visual skills. And so what it's important is we're taking taking those photographers and giving them very well vetted and concentrated information with experts, all video based. So that first course will be released in July, uh, photographer to videographer. I know we're not going to make filmmakers in, in 45 hours of content, but people get asked, you know, can you do this? And as a photographer, you better say yes. Safe to assume you're going back to Cuba sometime soon? Well, we're offering a, a trip in Cuba in March uh, 2017. Uh -huh. Only 10 students. We live in homes of uh, private families, and walk six to eight miles a day. Wow. Six to ten. What am I saying? Six to ten miles a day, um, all through Havana. As I keep saying, you should go to Cuba before Starbucks gets there. <laughs> I love you. Correct. Yeah. Peter. So I'm coming off a two-year stint as a product architect for Photo Shelter's uh, corporate uh, library product. And that was really incredible experience for me to be able to design a cloud service and, and get it implemented. Uh, I still do some work for the company, but not, um, not as the product head. And so I'm, I'm headed back to uh, writing books. And I've got a couple in the works. Um, the one that is, uh, is consuming me now uh, for, for uh, days and nights is a 
book on how to digitize uh, photo collections and how to do it really fast and then how to make it useful, how to, how to annotate it. I guess you mean prints, like fam- or Well, it's prints and slides and negatives. Every, okay. And uh, this came about because we uh, moved my dad into an apartment and there was an amazing photo archive in that house. And uh, that's stuff that goes back to you know, 1850s, I think. And, um, you know, everybody in the family wants to be able to see this. We also really want to capture the history and who these people are. And, and at this point, that's really my dad, who's absolutely sharp as a tack, can tell me a ton about who all these people are. So we're setting up um, copy stands for shooting the work with digital cameras and getting really nice, beautiful uh, reproductions. And, you know, we shoot the front and the back. And then we're putting it in Lightroom and cropping. And, and in some cases, I'm doing some, some uh, restoration work to the images. And, and then we'll do the same with slides and also with uh, color negatives. And this is something it's that exciting. just about every family is going to be facing. Because, yeah, photographer for sure. You know, it, it used to be, yeah, there was this shoebox in the closet that had yeah. all these neat stuff that you could flip through. Now it's like, you know, oh, look, we got grandpa's hard drive. Check the Explora site, the B&H Explora site, if you're listening to this through SoundCloud or iTunes, because we're going to put the links up to all the books and all this. Yeah. Ideas. Right. Tremendous, tremendous, great, great episode. Thank you, Katrine. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you can find Katrine's many books and photo work at katrineisman.com or photoshopdiva.com. And I encourage you to check out her Instagram at katrine underscore Eisman. That's E-I-S-M-A-N-N. Also, uh, huge thanks uh, to Peter. Look for Peter's book and work at Peter Crow. That's K R O G H dot com. From John, Jason, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs>